All right, so in this video, we're gonna look at the regulation of transcription in eukaryotes, specifically multicellular organisms. And so what we got finished talking about was the regulation of DNA packaging, right, in, in the form of chromatin. And we could modify DNA, or we can modify the proteins that DNA is wrapped around, those histones, in order to either package DNA more tightly, so we deny access to transcriptional machinery, or we open up the chromatin and we allow access to the machinery of transcription. Let's assume now it's open, and um, now we're looking at what determines whether or not that transcriptional machinery is going to bind to a promoter of a gene and turn that gene on. So we're looking at this level of regulation here. Now, there are two absolutely essential factors necessary for the regulation of transcription. And to understand these two is absolutely essential. The first is what we call the cis factors, the things that are connected to the gene itself. So cis factors are made out of double-stranded DNA, right? They are DNA sequences, and they're DNA sequences to which the other component binds, and the other component are the trans factors, the things that are not DNA, the things that are bind to the DNA. Those are called specific transcription factors. Okay, so let's reiterate here. The, the regulatory sequences, the cis factors, the DNA that controls the transcription of a gene, those are called enhancers. And the things that bind them the trans factors, the proteins, those are called specific transcription factors. And this is the most regulated stage of gene, of, of gene expression is here at the level of transcription. Here are those cis factors. Here are those enhancers. They can sometimes be called the control elements. They are sometimes called a group of control elements, might be called an enhancer, or in the most generic sense, they are called regulatory sequences. So right now, up to now, our view of a gene inclu included the promoter, and then exons and introns, and that poly A signal sequence. Okay, that's the bare minimum. But now we have to look at another part of a gene the regulatory sequences, the sequences of DNA associated with that gene that determine when and which cells that particular gene is going to be expressed in. Okay? So control elements, enhancers, regulatory sequences, these are all more or less synonymous to one another. Some of them might be these regulatory sequence can be upstream of the gene, the regulatory sequence can even be downstream of the gene, okay? But they're all associated with a gene and will determine whether or not that gene is going to be expressed at a particular time or in a particular cell. Now, the trans factor, the protein that binds to these specific sequences of DNA are called specific transcription factors. Now, specific transcription factors are special proteins in that they have a domain here that allows them to bind to very specific sequences of DNA, very specific enhancers. This is called the DNA binding domain of that protein. In addition, they have a domain, the proteins have a domain called the activation domain. And this is a domain that interacts with some other protein. Okay, so what that means is our transcription factor is going to bind to DNA and then recruit other proteins. Now I have a question here. Give an example of one of these from the LAC operon. Okay, so the LAC operon, even though we never used the word specific transcription factor, it had at least one, that cap binding protein. That cap binding protein had a DNA binding domain that allowed it to bind the cap binding site. Right? That was our regulatory sequence. And then it had an activation domain that interacted with what? With RNA polymerase. And its interaction with that RNA polymerase stabilized the RNA polymerase's binding to the promoter, and that activated transcription. 
Okay, so these are specific transcription factors that bind to the enhancers, regulatory sequences, control elements, right? These sequences that are associated with the gene. Okay, that's it. Those are the two really important elements of transcriptional regulation. So let's see how they work. Here we have our gene with the promoter, and there's the Tata box. Remember, in eukaryotes, right, that the RNA polymerase doesn't directly bind to the promoter. First, you get all of these general transcription factors. Be careful. These activators, right, these are specific transcription factors, and the things that bind to promoter are general transcription factors. Very confusing, so be very careful about that. Now, these specific transcription factors that we got finished talking about here, uh, I forgot to mention, are also called activators. And so that's what we see here, these specific transcription factors binding to the various control elements of an enhancer. All right, what's the next step? Well, the next step is, look at this, remember DNA, even though, look how far away this enhancer is, and, and that's quite common in eukaryotic cells, that the enhancer is quite far away from the gene that it regulates. That's okay, DNA can just simply boop, bend over, and now look, it's right there in the proximity of the promoter. And so what those activators in eukaryotic cells, what those activators recruit, what they bind to with their activation domains are various general transcription factors. Now, I didn't have you memorize all of the general transcription factors, but there was one that I wanted you to remember. Can you remember what it's called? It's the one that binds to this Tata box. The Tata binding protein is one of those general transcription factors. So what these activators do is they help the general transcription factors bind to the promoter. And then once they are bound to the promoter, they recruit RNA polymerase. And now we get a stabilized transcriptional complex at the promoter of a specific gene, and then we get the production of RNA. Now, it turns out that it is oftentimes more than just one type of activator that's necessary to promote the activation of transcription. And so genes are controlled by combinations of control elements. So let's take a, a good look here. We're going to look at two different genes, the albumin gene and the crystalline gene. Both of these genes are in human DNA. And as we talked about in the previous video, that that's genomic equivalence, that every cell of our body has all of the DNA, which means all of the genes, which means no matter what cell type we're looking at, we've got an albumin gene and a crystalline gene. Now, the albumin gene is controlled by this answer, enhancer that has a yellow, a gray, and a red uh, control element. And then our crystalline gene is controlled by this set of control elements. It has an orange, a gray, and a pink control elements. Okay. Now, the way in which activation works is the albumin gene needs an activator to bind to each one of these control elements before it's turned on. If anyone's missing, it's not going to get turned on. The crystalline gene needs an, uh, an activator to bind to each one of these control elements. If any of them are missing, it's not going to get turned on. So let's take a look at two different cell types. Because remember, differential gene expression. A particular cell has a particular structure and function because it turns on a set of genes and turns off a set of genes. So we have the liver cell. We have the lens cell. Now the lens requires crystalline. That's an important protein to be a lens cell, but it doesn't need albumin. Liver cells need albumin protein, but they don't need crystalline. So how is that determined? Well, the lens um, the crystalline protein or gene is expressed because the lens cell expresses the brown, the gray, and the pink activators. The brown, the gray, and the pink activators. So those bind to their control elements. Those recruit then the uh, general transcription factors, which recruits RNA polymerase, and then we get expression of the crystalline gene. But notice this, even though it has the gray 
activator, which binds, of course, to the gray control element there, it doesn't have the yellow, it doesn't have the red activators. So it doesn't express the albumin gene. Okay, let's take a look in the liver cell. So in the liver cell, we have, right, we want that albumin gene to be turned on. We don't want crystalline gene to be turned on. And let's take a look. Well, it has the red activator. It expresses the gray activator and it expresses the um, yellow activator. And sure enough, they each bind to their control elements. They recruit those general transcription factors, which recruits RNA polymerase, and we get the turning on of the albumin gene. Fantastic. However, lens cells do not express the orange activators, nor do they make the pink activators, which means the crystalline gene remains turned off. This is how differential gene expression occurs. Different cells produce different activators, which turn on a different set of genes. That is one of the most important concepts you can take away from this. Now, some of you may be sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, but wait, that, wait, 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 wait. Nah, there's still something wrong. What is it that you might be asking? Yeah, what is it that determines, well, how is it that the cell expresses the pink, the gray, and the brown activator? What is it that, that makes the cell express the, the yellow, the red, and the gray activators. That is an important question. If it's so important what activators are being expressed in a cell, then what determines what activators are being expressed in the cell? Activators are specific transcription factors, which are proteins. Proteins are encoded by genes. Genes are regulated. So that means, let's take a look at this. Here, we have a, trans a specific transcription factor that turns on all of the genes necessary to make a muscle cell. Right? It turns on this messenger RNA, it turns on that messenger, or it turns on uh, this particular gene, turns on this particular gene. Okay, so well, if, if that cell requires this transcription factor to make all of the various proteins necessary to be a muscle cell, then we're asking that same question, what determines what what determines whether or not the cell makes that particular activator? Well, guess what? This is a protein encoded by a gene in pink. What determines whether that protein is made? Well, it has a bunch of control elements associated with that gene, which is bound by an activator. All right, and then you can ask, well, what determines this activator is being expressed? Right? Well, that activator is being expressed because it's turning on its own expression. Well, what originally turns on that activator? And you can just keep going and going and going. There's got to be some form of asymmetry that occurs within these cells where finally an activator is turned in one cell and not turned on in another cell. Okay, this is MyOD. And MyOD is a... Um, master regulatory gene in that it turns on an activator and expresses an activator that turns on all of the genes necessary to become a muscle cell. Master regulatory genes are absolutely essential for development. Another master regulatory gene is called the antennapedia gene, which encodes the antennapedia activator. That's a transcription factor. Right? That's our uh, specific transcription factor, our activator, our trans factor, and it binds to control elements that turn on all of the various genes necessary to turn cells into leg cells. Uh huh. So what happens then if there is a mistake in the way in which the antennapedia gene is being turned on? Maybe it's being turned on in the wrong place. Well, what happens if it's accidentally turned on uh, where uh, antenna cells should be? Well, now suddenly the antenna become legs. And that was, that was a mutation that didn't even occur within the antennapedia gene itself. It was a mutation that occurred in where in, in the control elements that control where antennapedia is going to be expressed. Just one little mutation, bang, 
you have this massively changed body plan, legs coming out of the head instead of antenna. This is the way body form evolves, not through mutations within the protein encoding regions of genes, but mutations in the control elements of genes that control where and when a gene is going to be expressed. And when you start messing around with that, then you can start getting big changes in body structure without complex mutations. So, if all cells derive from a single zygote, right? We all derived from that first cell, that egg that was fertilized by a sperm, the zygote. If that's the case, if all cells arise from that, then how do cells start expressing different activators? How is it that a lens cell expresses a different subset of activators than a liver cell? Where does that first asymmetry come from if we started off with just one cell? There's two main ways that asymmetry arises. The first is cytoplasmic determinants, and the second is inductive signals. So cytoplasmic determinants. Now remember, the egg, and well, I guess we'll learn this a little bit later, but the, the um, meiosis, the formation of an egg, or oogenesis, is strange in that it ensures each egg is going to have a ton of cytoplasm, which means there's going to be a ton of molecules already loaded in the cytoplasm of that egg before the sperm ever fertilizes it. And within that cytoplasm are a whole bunch of activators that have already been made and a whole bunch of messenger RNAs that have been made that encode those activators. So we're preloaded with those activators and those are called cytoplasmic determinants. So then the sperm fertilizes that egg and now there's our zygote. What happens is even as early as that zygotic stage, some of these activators that, that, have, that are maternally derived, that are in the cytoplasm, that were in the cytoplasm of the egg, they are already starting to be asymmetrically divided up within the zygote itself. So that when it divides, already you have some form of asymmetry that can go on and on, and then that asymmetry can be amplified as more cell divisions occur. So the asymmetric di division of cytoplasmic determinants, so that maternally derived cytoplasm, that is one important way in which cells start to differentiate. Now remember that we could not directly convert mammary gland cells to other different cell types, right? That trans uh, differentiation doesn't happen. But if we take the nucleus of that and we put it into an egg, then we can get it to uh, become every cell um, and, and direct the development of a full-blown uh, sheep. Which means there was something within the cytoplasm of this egg that was able to reprogram the nucleus of those mammary gland cells. And remember, right, that, that Dr. Yamanaka figured out what some of those repro reprogramming factors were. And when he then took those reprogramming, whoops, uh, reprogramming factors, I should be basically circling this, when he took those reprogramming factors and put them into uh, specialized cells, he can turn them into what he called pluripotent stem cells, which were essentially embryonic cells. And then he could, depending on what kind of cultures he incubated them in, turn them into all the various cell types. So, what were those reprogramming factors that Dr. Yamanaka uh, uh, found? Cytoplasmic determinants. Maternal RNA and proteins that are activators that be, become asymmetrically derived and able to then direct the development of um, the differentiation of different cells. Okay, the second, now we have cells dividing and dividing and dividing. And now that you have a multicellular organism, 
cells become different from one another geographically. So these cells at the top are inherently different than these cells at the bottom because they have different neighbors. Which means if one set of neighbors expressed a paracrine signal, remember, right, expressing signals, secreting these proteins that act as signaling molecules that are received by only the cells next to them. So we're not going these cells aren't going to receive that signal. These cells are going not going to receive that signal. So when these cells receive that signal, that starts to turn on the expression of other genes, which will encode other activators. These are called inductive signals. Signals by one neighboring cells that influences what activators are going to be turned on by neighboring cells. So you get an entire different uh, developmental pathway being taken on by these neighbors here. Different than what these guys are going to have and different than what these guys are going to have. Those are called inductive signals. Inductive signals are extremely important and were discovered, or the idea was discovered many years ago by German developmental biologists. Uh, a guy named Spemann discovered that within a... Um, zebrafish, uh, excuse me, within a xenopus, that's a, a frog, a xenopus embryo, during development, there was this part called the dorsal lip. And what he found is that it was involved in inducing the, um, this part of the embryo here to take on a dorsal fate, the head, the brain, the eyes, and so on and so forth. And he, he had this hypothesis. He said, I think this is the, the part, these are the cells that induce all the cells above it to become a dorsal fate. So what he did was he pulled out the cells of the dorsal lip and he implanted them into the ventral side of another embryo. So now there was an embryo that had the normal ventral, um, dorsal lip, but then it had a second dorsal lip right here, right? That was implanted. What happened? Well, you got your head and your eyes made here, and then this dorsal lip induced all of these guys to also become a head and eyes and a back. So you had two fish or two uh, uh, embryos that were connected belly to belly. And I have a video on your Canvas site that shows this experiment. It's pretty awesome. So we call this dorsal lip here, the set of cells, the Speymann organizer. And now what we know is we know that the Speymann organizer secretes these inductive signals, cordon, noggin, several others. And as they are secreted, as the cells receive those signals, they start to uh, uh, take different developmental pathways. They start to express different activators which turn on different developmental pathways that are responsible for forming the um, dorsal uh, body plan of the embryo. Okay, so now you have an idea here of exactly when it is or what factors are involved that cause cells to start making different activators. We have asymmetrical distribution of cytoplasmic determinants early on in development, and then eventually we have inductive events. Cells, neighboring cells start secreting signals that are received by only the direct neighbors, and that causes different developmental pathways to start. I do encourage you to go to Canvas and watch that video about transplanting the Speymann organizer. It's pretty cool. So next, we're going to talk about post-transcriptional regulation. What happens when we've transcribed that DNA into messenger RNA? What forms of, of regulation are still available?